subscribe to Factly and hit the bell icon for updates. भैया मेरा वोटर आईडी करा। प्लांट रजिस्ट्रेशन करवा दो। मेरा स्कॉलरशिप। फाइल माय आईडी आर। दूसरा फॉर्म लेके आ। रूल पता है क्या? रजिस्ट्रेशन कहाँ है? बाद में आओ टाइम लगेगा। लंच के बाद। Is there a simple way to understand government rules? Hello everyone. Welcome to Decode, a show where we simplify government related information and also discuss current affairs. Not the kind of affairs we people love to see. The 2019 general elections are just around the corner. Keeping that in mind, we have decided to focus on election related topics such as what elections actually are, the voting process, the political parties and the manifestos, women's participation in elections and much more in our first season. Along the way, we will discuss some interesting facts and no, we are not going to divulge any information about free food or alcohol or money or laptop or cookers or TV sets usually associated with elections. <laughs> That's sure a lot of free stuff. Today's topic is our national elections. As all of you would know, we are the largest democracy in the world. Surely larger than 56 inches. If you don't know... I don't think that you should live in India. <laughs> well, that is one option we don't suggest. The other option is to watch this show. So let's see, how did we get here at the first place? When we got independence in 1947, our constituent assembly decided that a democratic form of government would be the best for our country. Democracy is, to quote Abraham Lincoln, a government of the people, by the people and for the people. And when he said by, he meant by and not B-U-Y. Now that is democracy in a nutshell. Now there are primarily two forms of people's governance. One is direct and the other is representative. Direct is where people personally participate in every decision. It's like when you're with your friends, you get a direct say in deciding what kind of pizza you want to eat. Remember that one picky eater who wants a gluten and cheese free pizza? Anyway, as the group grows bigger, direct participation becomes difficult. Imagine a larger group of people where every person is trying to order for the whole group. We have chaos. That's where the representative form comes into the picture. Where the people select a representative who ultimately takes a decision on their behalf. You better take your selection seriously or you might have that one picky eater making important decisions for you which would mean gluten free, cheese free pizza for life. No offense to people with allergies. So the selection of your representative is called electing and the whole process involved is called elections. Free and fair elections are a must for a thriving democracy. Realizing this, the Constituent Assembly did two things. First, it included Article 324, which facilitated the creation of the Election Commission of India, that is responsible for advising and administering elections in our country. Second, the Parliament enacted two key electoral laws, the Representation of People Act 1950 and the Representation of People Act 1951, which established the rules regarding elections. These two actions provided the foundation for Indian elections. Also, the Constituent Assembly, in an effort to make elections unbiased, made the Election Commission of India, or the ECI, an autonomous organization with accountability to the judiciary alone. The ECI has several important rights, from deciding the election schedule, to administering the elections, and from the appointment of election executives, to the monitoring of political parties. The powers given to the ECI were so well thought out and powerful that it has been hailed as a modern institutional innovation which had very little precedent across the world. In short, the ECI is like my wife, autonomous, powerful and answerable to a very few. Now, even with all these powers, for the first election which we held in 1951-52, it was quite a tough task for the ECI because as a country we were just getting on our feet. We didn't have great transport system. The literacy rate was just around 16%. Moreover, it was the first time in the world that elections were being conducted at such a huge scale. In spite of all these negative factors, the ECI did a tremendous job in conducting elections. First, it gave voting rights to all the people above 21, irrespective of their caste, creed, gender and education. And no, I did not make a mistake. Voting age during the first election was 21. 
Next, it introduced election symbols for candidates. This was done to counter illiteracy. Can you guess whose party symbol was this? I know what you guys are thinking, but no, this was the Congress party symbol. Also, do you know what these are? No, not a chanda receipt or a parking ticket, not a lottery ticket for sure. These were the ballot papers handed over to voters. Each voter would walk into a room. There would be separate boxes representing each candidate. And the voter would drop the ballot paper into the box of his or her choice. While today, every losing party or candidate claims that EVMs must have been rigged and that votes must not be counted the way they are done. Back in the day, I guess the elections could be called by just weighing the boxes. <laughs> just kidding. The ECI also provided polling booths to all the people within three miles of their residence. In fact, one polling booth was set up for just nine people, which means there were Newton-like officers even then to make this possible. And as a result of this, there was a 44.5% turnout on election day. People were so impressed with the way elections were conducted that some people wanted to vote for the chief election commissioner in the next elections. In fact, the feat was so amazing that Sudan invited Sukumar Sen, the then chief election commissioner, to guide them through their elections. Since our first elections, our country has been the largest democracy in the world. Wait, maybe our ever-growing population has something to do with that. For every new election, the numbers of voters, parties and contestants have been increasing consistently, thereby increasing the infrastructure needed to conduct elections. But the ECI has always risen to the challenge. That said, it wasn't a smooth ride all along. 1970 to 1991 was a troublesome period for elections. Election violence had become quite common, and instances of assault, kidnapping, murder, looting, arson and rioting occurred in several places. Sounds like a gang war movie, huh? Malpractices like voter bribery and black money in elections have increased as well. Disregard for election rules was very high, especially in Bihar and UP. The situation there was so bad that a term so peculiar as peaceful booth capturing came into usage. <laughs> it's like two robbery gangs sharing their loots peacefully. All these incidents hit the credibility of the Indian elections, casting doubts on the ECI's ability. But then came Faisal. <laughs> Just kidding. The then came TN Session. Under his leadership, the ECI decided to put its foot down strongly against all election malpractice. Session tackled malpractices by employing two strategies. One, by naming and shaming the violators through the media. And two, taking serious violations to court. Not only malpractices, the ECI went against elites who were trying to flout the rules. In 1987, the ECI clashed with the then Prime Minister Rajiv Gandhi over his insistence of advancement of presidential polls. In 2002, when the Gujarat Vidhan Sabha was dissolved, the ECI fought with state and central government regarding the schedule of the elections. It disqualified a Madhya Pradesh cabinet minister for filing election expenses incorrectly and objected to a state government's disciplinary proceedings against an officer. These actions of the ECI restored the faith of the public in our elections. Along with these steps, the ECI, the government and the political parties joined hands to bring several improvements in our election process. As the literacy rate of our country improved, voting age was brought down from 21 to 18. To stop impersonation, marking voters' fingers with the iconic indelible ink was introduced. And then the most notable change happened in the electoral process. What started as one ballot box per contestant was replaced by a single ballot box. It was like the ECI put up its hand and said, Itna paisa me itna ich milenga. And as technology made progress, electronic voting machines or EVMs were introduced. Voter verifiable paper audit trail or VVPAT was introduced recently for increasing transparency. Another significant change was made recently. The availability of the NOTA or none of the above option. This has been added to voting options to express voter dissatisfaction about the contesting candidates. So we can say with some confidence that we, as a country, are making progress in making our elections fair, foolproof and easy for voter participation. Let us look at how the numbers have changed between 1952 and 2014.
These numbers speak about the scale by which our elections have grown and the progress we have made as a democracy. The Economist Intelligence Unit, while measuring our democracy index, gave our electoral process a score of 9.17 on 10. I'm pretty sure an Indian parent watching this is probably thinking, why not a 10 on 10? <laughs> but honestly, 9.17 is a very good score. The success is mostly owed to the Election Commission of India. All this glowing data doesn't mean we have a perfect election system. We still have some major issues that need to be resolved, such as voter bribing, magical party funding, political candidates with criminal backgrounds, and huge election spending by contestants. Another major issue that luckily hasn't happened yet, but can happen, is the chance of appointing a biased chief election commissioner. Are you talking about me? Who are you? <laughs> no, we're not talking about you. Some of these concerns are to be addressed by the political parties and some by the ECI. The sooner these are addressed, the better. But that should not deter us from acknowledging and appreciating the people who are involved in conducting elections and bringing our country to the democratic state that it is today. Credit is mainly due definitely to our election commission, whose perseverance has led to fair elections. Then we have all the election commission officers, government employees and security officials who work incredibly hard to put up the show that is a great Indian election. And of course, the most important element, the enthusiasm of the people. Thank you all for a job well done. Take a bow if you have ever voted. Before we wrap this episode, we would like to recollect a few words of the first Chief Election Commissioner Sukumar Sen after the ECI had successfully conducted independent India's first general elections. The future of the democratic way of life in India depended very largely on the success of an experiment called elections. Looking at the public enthusiasm and satisfaction, we can say that first elections were successful and I hope that future general elections will be held with great public spirit and serve as a model for all democratic elections. His words ring true even today in the sense that democracy will be successful as long as there are free and fair elections. So in that spirit, let us celebrate our democracy by increased participation in the upcoming elections and make it more successful than the previous ones. How do we do that, you ask? I have a slogan for you. Ab ki bar, 75% yaar. Hashtag 2019 elections, hashtag target 75. And with that, we come to an end of the first episode of Decode. On episode 2, we talk about voting and voter registration. Thank you for tuning in. If you like our show, please like, comment and subscribe and tell your friends about us too.